Okay, everybody. So what I'm doing on this painting again is uh, continuing to find my personal voice when it comes to shape. Uh, shape is just one of those elements, one of the design elements. Again, we only have seven. And given that shape is uh, so readily visible when we look at a painting, it's just really important to spend time investigating all the ways that you can discover shape so that you give yourself more opportunity to find the shapes you love as well as the shapes you don't love. As you can see from this painting, I started out with a lot of curvilinear shapes and I like curvilinear shapes, but this painting you can see is now beginning to be very rectilinear. I'm gonna make sure that whatever's left really gets seen. And that's basically what I'm doing. And that's why I'm using this value. And that is just so, so important. If you want your shapes to stand out, there has to be a fair amount of difference in value or they're just not gonna show. If I were painting these shapes right now in a mid-tone yellow or a mid-tone red or whatever, I mean, you, you would see the shapes but they would be less obvious. And that is a very personal choice. There's nothing wrong with shapes that are less obvious, but for me, I think I really care so much about unusual shapes that I really want them to show. I'm very emphatic about that. I'm not saying, well, you know, if you happen to notice them, that's fine. But, and you know, that again, that's, that's your personal voice. So be sure you listen to that. You may not want high contrast, but I do. And I only know that because of the many paintings I've done and for the period of time I've been painting. But that's the only way you find out. If you don't try high contrast and low contrast, then you don't know that about yourself. So it's a continual process of self-discovery. Uh, that's what your personal voice is. It's, um, do I like this better than that? And it's a constant comparison between something that's high contrast to low contrast, uh, different edge qualities, you know, do I like a hard edge versus a soft edge? Do I want things really uh, very crowded versus lots of space? Uh, and that's why we spent so much time in the very first masterclass on in Discover Your Soul on the contrast sketchbook, because that really allows you to see these dramatically different things. And every time you have that chance to create high contrast in your painting, that is a choice. And contrast means that you can go one extreme to the other. And you really need to know where you are on that uh, range between high contrast and low contrast or between curves and rectilinear or between warm and cool or light and dark or jagged and smooth you know it's it's all the things we've already talked about but this is where it starts to come into play you know when you're actually painting and it matters whether things you know how you're feeling that day or your personal voice you know do you want things to be bold and obvious or subtle and quiet just gonna tape it into place and see how that works if it works. So once you find where you'd like to have it, you know, again, tape it in place and just keep moving it around. And you don't have to commit to it until you're really sure that that's what you like. You can really see the, the interaction between positive and negative shapes. Once you decide what shapes you love and, and you start to build this repertoire of say stencils or whatever that you've cut out of Bristol board, you can create a painting, even if it's large scale, you can kind of go a lot faster than and say that it's a time saver because you don't have to reinvent these shapes you love. You just have to keep adding to this pile of, you know, stencils or masks or whatever it is you have. And they, because you keep pulling them out, 
when you do various paintings, that's also a way to have cohesion. If you repeat certain stencils again and again, but in different ways and in, in different amounts and perhaps one's a pattern even, um, that in itself, you're, you're practicing this repetition of a shape. And again, that's gonna be another way that you can increase your harmony, uh, your cohesion within a series, even a series of lots of different mediums and different color palettes. If shape is your unifier, it can come from these stencils. Um, I have done paintings where, or Dave had days in my studio where I can spend a whole eight hours, you know, painting, and then I feel really exhausted by the end of the day. It's hard in the body to be standing, and you know, um, it, it's exhausting thinking. Also, I, I mean, it's not like the play stage. I'm really thinking a lot here, and as I stand back, there are so many decisions to make. Uh, it's just like when you drive a car; you're constantly making decisions. You have to to be safe. I am going to continue on with this painting and I'm um, now thinking about, again, uh, distressing the surface with sandpaper, trying out some glazes to make the color more complex. I feel like it's pretty harmonious, but you know, when I put on that light color, that's pretty um, different from what's going on in the background. So number one, sanding it is going to make it feel more at home, but then Glazing it is going to give it a little bit more warmth because all these areas here are very, very warm. And I did make sure that this is warm, but it's a solid. Um, there's a little bit of texture, but uh, I think it might be good just to see how the glazing goes. And I might use a sponge roller to get a very even glaze. And I would want to really um, thin it out with airbrush medium because I want it to be, um, I don't want it to be too strong in color so I need to kind of dilute it but I would dilute it with the airbrush medium. So those are a couple things I'm thinking about. I do feel like um, this has all been the explorer stage, you know, shapes that I really think are kind of unusual and strange which I really like. The color is, is a limited palette, you know, I really just use like the red and the yellow. There was some black a little bit of glazing with the quinacridone nickel azo gold. When I uh, made this red um, a lighter value, made it a tone, sorry, a tint with white, not a tone. It could have been a tone, I guess, um, mixed with gray. It did go a little purplish, and you know, purple being the complement of yellow, I think that adds a certain dimension to this painting. So if I do any final, you know, as I go into the clarify stage, if I do any final touches, um, I might be thinking of adding a bit of this lavender color. It looks lavender, but what it really is, um, it tends to look lavender because it's uh, so close to the yellow. So that's kind of like simultaneous contrast. Uh, color can be impacted by what's around it. So um, it may look more purplish just because there's yellow. And if there wasn't yellow, it would look more maybe pinkish. Again, I had this shape coming down from here. It went like this. I remember that. And by sanding in a localized area where I remember that shape was, plus I can see a little hint of it here, um, the sandpaper is catching the upper ridge of that. And um, I kind of like that. Like, I don't want it to go all the way back to the red, but I do like seeing hints of what it used to be there. Here I see some more texture. I'm just gonna see if I can like reveal more of that red there. I can also like just 
test it out and see, you know, can I draw lines? And yes, it's just pulling off the paint. Um, it's not, you know, cutting through the canvas or anything like that. I have control over that, so I kind of like that because that means I can take um, a yardstick. I could make a line. You know, I could either do it with graphite, but I can also draw a line. Again, not too much pressure because you don't want to cut through the canvas. Um, there's my line. So actually, I like that quite a bit. And I know that I didn't cut through the canvas because I can just see the paint underneath it. I see the yellow and I see the red. If I had gone all the way through it, um, I think I would know it. At least I hope. If I use the wallpaper scraper on this gray area, there's a lot of color behind it. It's a little bit um, heavier handed than sandpaper, so if I wanted to go faster, so I'm going to take a photo of these little triangles, as you can see. Let's see here, and it might be too busy, but I can always knock it back. That's what I just did. I'm not sure if I like that or not. Um, sometimes things come out a little bit more, um, they, I don't know, they just have more, they take more attention than you intend. So this happens to be a very, um, it's a, a nice glowing glaze, but I, um, I still want to have some control over how much I'm putting on there. And again, if I take some of this and put it on, say, um, like this white area here, it's obviously pretty intense. But then I can take a paper towel and take most of it off so that there's just a little bit left. A little bit of a glow and then it goes into the gray. And that's what I mean by glazing. I don't want it to be super dark. I want it to be very, very subtle. So maybe the only way for me to do that is to put it on and then kind of rub it off in selective areas. You see how much vi more vibrant that red is than, you know, this is pretty dull. Slightly lighter value, more saturated. Um, and then I'll put this in, it'll be too much. And then I can always sand this back. Just trying to get some vibrancy back into, but very selective. You know, I'm not making all areas that are red this vibrant, just some. And, you know, if I didn't sand this back, then it would be thicker as well. So playing with thick versus thin. So I'm going to have a few other areas of punctuation. This little square. Just bring back a little bit more punch. And then there's another area like here, I think, this line. Not sure I need to do all of it. 